Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and welcome to Inside Fashion. Today we'll be talking to Arnold Scazzi. Arnold Scazzi is sometimes referred to as New York's last custom designer. His beautifully tailored and dramatically designed clothes are presented two times a year to his small army of devoted customers. It's a very real pleasure to have you with us here today, Arnold. Thank you. Glad that you're here. You were raised in Montreal and in Melbourne, Australia, educated in Canada and, and in France. It's quite a background and certainly one that is not typical of many fashion designers. How has this eclectic background influenced your work? The part of growing up in Australia was uh, done with an aunt who was very fashionable and who dressed at Scaffarelli and Chanel. And so I think all of my background and feeling about clothes came from her, from my Aunt Ida. She's a fascinating woman and she uh, traveled a great deal and because of her travels she was very knowledgeable and a woman who sort of, um, you know, grew all the time and was always growing. And so this sort of, I hope, rubbed off on me. I think it did. And her whole lifestyle uh, sort of was done with great elegance. Uh, something that I don't think happens today. So I was very fortunate to have been part of it, I think. Did you ever have any formal training as a designer? Yes, lots. Many years of formal training. I uh, started in Canada when I came back from Australia and still as a teenager. And I began, uh, I went to a wonderful school there called the Cotton Noir Capone School of Design. And it was the beginning of my formal training before going on to Paris, where I studied at the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture. And then I went from there to work at a house called Paquin, which was then a very stylish and known house uh, of fashion in Paris. How did your apprenticeship with Paquin influence your design philosophy? Just the whole feeling of working in a, in a place where there was wonderful quality, beautiful fabrics, and where there were no uh, limitations to what you could do, what you could design, and how it could be designed. How important is that kind of formal apprenticeship to the career of a designer? Well, my way of thinking is the most important thing, because if you have a good basis uh, for something, for any career, then obviously you can go on from there and do your own thing. Was that European training as important or more important than your early training on 7th Avenue? I think it was the most important part of my life. And I think traveling, first of all, gives you a feeling of, of what other people in other countries are doing and, and that there are other people outside of your own little world that you usually grow up in. How did you wend your way from Paris to New York? I arrived here in about 1953, I guess. I went to, a, to uh, meet a man named Charles James, who was a then very well-known custom designer. And uh, he heard of my background and immediately said, would you like to stay in New York and, and apprentice with me? And I said, absolutely. That was my dream. So I was very lucky. It just started right away. That was the second day I was in New York. How long did you work with him? I worked with Charles James for two and a half years then decide it was time to go into your own business, a ready-to-wear business? I was going to go into a made-to-order business at that time. At one time, your very successful ready-to-wear line was carried by over 200 American stores. Then you decided to design couture clothes, and you discontinued the ready-to-wear line. What made you decide to devote yourself to a custom couture collection? At that time, I'd been doing so many things. I had about, oh, eight or ten licensing agreements. I was doing uh, also uh, um, a boutique collection four times a year and the couture ready to wear four times a year. So I did nothing but work. And I suddenly decided in 1964 that I w was working too hard and that I had no, was not having any fun out of life. So I decided to stop everything and have a sabbatical. And I went to Europe for a year, and then I came back and thought, now what do I really want to do that I'd love to do? And I went back to my first dream, which was made-to-order clothes. 
I like the idea of working directly with the uh, customer and uh, working, finding out what her life was about and what kind of clothes she needed and, and uh, filling a need in her life. Where did you get the backing to do that? The backing. Well, I made a great deal of money in the ready-to-wear business and all the licensing that I'd done, so I had the backing. There was no problem. Where did you ever get the backing to go into business in the first place? Oh, I'd save two thousand dollars, and I guess in uh, 1957, that's all you needed if you wanted to make up some dresses and present them to the stores. And stores were very open to any new ideas and new people. And I think. My timing was right in the kind of things that I did. And where were you housed? In my apartment, which was a, a, a walk up on 58th Street and Lexington Avenue. And we had a tailor and a seamstress, and everything was made out of that apartment and for the first year of business. Then we skyrocketed and we did a lot of other things. By the works of what artists have you been most influenced? I don't think I'm influenced by any artist, really. Have you been inspired by any of them? Well, I'm inspired um, uh, uh, by Louise Nevelson because she's a friend and I dress her. So I find a lot of... Uh, I love her feeling about clothes. And she's very creative uh, in wearing clothes. And it's a wonderful mesh because she finds that I'm very creative in, in making clothes for her. And I've made a lot of clothes for people in the theater and in film. And uh, the most important thing you want is that person be uh, relaxed and easy in, in their clothing and that it does something for them, you know. I made a lot of clothes for Barbara Streisand and I found her extraordinarily creative and there was a wonderful give and take as there is with Nevelson and many other people, people well, who are not necessarily artists. how she adapted her taste to your designs, for example? Or well, the there was a white file wedding dress in the collection that had a hood and was very covered up. And she called the next day and said, uh, would I do, would I consider making the wedding dress in black? And I said, yes, I guess so, but it's a terrible color for a wedding. And she said, I'm not going to use it for a wedding. I want to use it as an evening coat. I think it would be a terrific evening coat. And of course it was, and, and she was right about it. Does she know a great deal about clothes? Oh, yes, she has a great feeling. Again, it's very, it's an innate feeling, as Nevelson's is with the way she dresses. I mean, you know, the, she can take three outfits and take a piece of each and put it together, and there's a whole new feeling about the, the outfit, you know, that she's wearing. Are there any colors that you've always thought were not appropriate or not flattering for women? I think um, grayed, dirty colors in the evening are very unflattering. I think in the evening when lights are, when you're mainly in artificial light, the up colors are more helpful and bright colors to me are more attractive and uh, I try to use them. As much and as what is your favorite up color? Red, shocking pink. Um, red and shocking pink mixed with purple or orange. All those colors together. I love all that spectrum of of pinks and reds and oranges. And what are the most yeah. helpful colors for the daytime? I guess blues are, are a good safe bet. Bright red, I think red is great in the daytime and can be helpful. What about the relationship between fashion and interior design? Were you deeply involved in the design of that apartment? Yes, very much so. I've decorated all of my residences myself. and. Um, I, I think there is a relationship, again, only in the, that what you see must be attractive to you. So you begin an apartment or a residence by finding out what's there, very much like you have a body to build a dress on. You have the four walls and you must now decorate them. And uh, you do it with the, same, with the same eye that you do anything else, you know. Does that same philosophy about colors that make you feel comfortable and pleasing um, relate to the way you design a house or an apartment too? I think so. I think the, you can use great color and very upbeat kind of um, wallpapers and prints and things 
in rooms that you're not going to be in very long. I have a red and yellow hallway which you pass through. Uh, it's bright yellow, uh, bright red, and it has bright yellow doors. Fashion, the inside story, will return in a moment. We now return to Fashion, the Inside Story. As a designer whose work is not subject to the whims of store buyers, do you feel a sense, a greater sense of creative freedom now than when you catered to a mass market? Yes, much more so. One of the reasons that I went in to made to order clothes was because I wanted to feel that freedom. I felt that I, uh, you know, was being pushed by stores to do certain things that I, that I really didn't like doing and didn't want to do. I can see how a designer could easily prefer the liberty of made-to-order and custom design and how a customer would like the results. But don't any clients ever feel a bit uneasy about spending, I guess, four to about $8,000 for one single item of clothing? Say you spend $4,000 on a dress and you wear it for eight years, it really comes out to being $500 a a year, doesn't it? So you, it depends how you look at it. You know, I think it, uh, made to order clothes are very special and they're really for very special people who understand about clothes. They're for a woman who would rather have four great things in her wardrobe a season than 40. I mean, uh, I would think that the normal amount of money spent by an average upper middle class woman who's buying clothes for weekends and for parties and for just living in, uh, that she probably spends as much money as one of my clients spends. But Arnold, by any standard, $4,000 to even $6,500 is a lot of money. Why don't you give us some idea of the breakdown of the cost? For example, we know, everybody knows that hand labor is expensive, but how much does the well, fabric cost? hand labor, you pay a great seamstress today between $350 to $400 a week. You pay uh, the fabric that comes in, which is exclusive to me. Does all of your fabric come from Everything Europe? Everything comes from Europe, yes. Yeah. Because we don't find the quality or the design quality here. They're, the mass-produced fabric people are not interested in doing uh, something that's terribly special for, for just uh, 10 yards of fabric or 15 yards of fabric. They want thousands of yards. You can't have that. How much does that cost a yard, and how many yards? It might yards cost anywhere from 150 to 200 dollars a yard, and you might use five yards in a dress. So you're somewhere around a thousand dollars. That has nothing to do with linings, um, all the trimmings, belts, the fitting time. I mean, when you think that a woman can come in and have five or six fittings on a dress, uh, and that each time she comes, that dress is totally taken apart, re for her and put back together again. That all costs a great deal of money. And how many days do you allot all put together, for example, About to make each weeks. garment? Two weeks of, I mean, anywhere from about 80 hours to make a, a garment. How many dresses of that sort can you sell a year? Can you make a year, let alone sell? We can make about um, 500 a year, I would think. And we don't want to make more. And how many customers generally buy these 500 garments? About 100 customers a season. And how many seasons for you, too? Two seasons a year. How do you begin? Do you begin your work with a sketch or applying fabric to a mannequin or dealing with a live model? How does one of your designs evolve? I begin somewhere between the fabric and the sketch. I mean, either the sketch comes first because I have an idea for a new shape or, or a, a different detail of some kind, or, or I'll see a fabric that, that is spectacular and that I then do a sketch for. We talked earlier that you often dress the well-known, who often, too, have distinct ideas of their own about how they'd like to dress. Well, again, doing made-to-order clothes is so different from any other type of clothing because you do get very involved with the client. And yes, she does tell you how she wants to look, and then it's up to you to make her look that way. Joan Rivers, I guess, was uh, is the most recent person. But um, and how do you envision Joan Rivers, who, on the one hand, is a broad-based comedian, yes, as a performer, on the other hand, wears these elegant clothes. How do you well, she bring wants, the two she together? She wants very much to look very sophisticated, very New York, 
And, and uh, I think, again, if we go back to it, if she feels comfortable in that kind of clothing and she looks right in it, and she does, then it's very important to, to make those kind of clothes for her. There must be all sorts of things that you know about that are helpful to tone down certain parts of the body to make almost anyone's silhouette look more ideal. Will you share some of your camouflage secrets with us? We've done all kinds of tricks where you uh, take darker panels of fabric at the sides of a, of a dress, which automatically slims down the silhouette. Um, there are uh, certain things that, that are sort of interesting that women come to you and say, well, I have very broad shoulders, therefore I don't want shoulder pads or I don't want my shoulder broaden or whatever. And what they don't realize is that might be a very good attribute of theirs that they should use and, and, uh, and exaggerate rather than, than trying to slim it down. I was, it was interesting to me when I first did clothes for Joan Crawford to find that she really had those big shoulders that, that Adrian well, not didn't... not shoulder pads. No, well, it, you, it was just to shape it, but that Adrian didn't have to do very much to... Uh, I mean, he, he had no other choice almost than to give her those shoulders. He just exaggerated them. How have your customers changed in the 20 years that you've been in business? Well, in this kind of business? the made-to-order customer years ago was thought of as being an older, very wealthy uh, woman. And today, it's interesting, there... Um, the customer is much younger. She's a woman basically in her 40s. How important is fantasy as an element of fashion design? The most. How funny you'd ask that. Nobody ever asked that. I think it's the most important. And whenever I do a class in a school, I always say, I don't care what you design, but just make it be as fantastic as you can. Because I think when a designer is starting out, you can... It's the one time that you are not, you know, guided by any rules. You can do whatever you want. And I think uh, fantasy and uh, what you dream about is the most important thing in fashion. How do you think that the clothes that you design reflect the trends of society currently? The women that I dress want to, not necessarily they want to look rich, but they, they want to state that they believe in again, in quality and in the, the, um, the things of life that, will, that have always been there and will never change. Is that what those clothes tell us about those clients? I think so, the because if it? you look at clothes in museums, you know, all the beautiful clothes from the turn of the century or whatever, um, there was a great feeling for detail, for quality, for art in, in the clothes, you know, the people that made the handmade laces and the embroideries and, and uh, the people who, who dyed the fabrics. And they were all considered sort of artists in their way. And I think that's sadly what we've lost a great deal of in our time. You dress artists and actresses and racing stable. Ladies. Ladies. Yes. <laughs> Is there something that they all share, and however diverse their backgrounds? Yes, they have a great deal of energy, first of all. There are women who are interested in, in sort of life and, and, uh, and living it, getting a great deal out of their lives, and also giving a great deal and sharing a great deal. Do you think that your interest in and affinity for their affluent lifestyle helps you to understand and meet their fashion needs? Absolutely. Right. Sure. I mean, I go to a lot of the balls that they go to, I go to a lot of the dinner parties that they go to, and I go to Saratoga in the summer with my racing pals, and I go to Europe, and, uh, and wherever I go mainly wherever they are, uh, because they are my friends, but, and also it gives me a great feeling of how they live and what they need in their lives. Are there any women that you can think of that by your standards, would personify American beauty? The first opinion you form uh, about anyone is the way they look. So I think that that first look must personify in some way what you are like underneath, what your personality is like. But I think uh, Jacqueline Kennedy is a marvelous uh, example of, of uh, what I've just said. And I think she personifies in our time what uh, glamour and uh, dressing well 
and showing yourself, showing your personality off to the best advantage is. What do you think, and how would you describe that rare quality that is so often referred to as taste? Well, again, I think it's innate. I don't think you learn it. Can there be anything new in fashion design, or has it all already been done? It's always new because uh, the proportion changes. You know, we're in a time now in 1983 of broad, the broad-shouldered look. But if you took out that old suit from, you know, 1944 that also had a padded shoulder and a broad shoulder, you'd find that it looked totally dated and, and looked like 1944 because the proportion of clothes change all the time. Are there any widely accepted styles today of which you particularly disapprove? Layers. I hate layers. I think it's very unattractive to, to see a woman sort of loaded down with lots of <laughs> things on her. First of all, it adds a lot of extra bulk. Usually it's done by the woman who is too short and too small to do it. So she really looks, she's dwarfed by the, all of this stuff. And then when they begin to get undressed, it's a mess. You've been called by some the first American designer to become involved in licensing. Is that true? Yes, I did the first uh, licensing w uh, in 1957, which is a long do? time ago. I did uh, children's wear, and I did men's ties and men's sweaters, and I did the first uh, Ben Kong collections in 1958. You know, licensing really meant that you were being given credit for designing what, you, what designers had always designed but never been given credit for before been the greatest satisfaction of your career? Having it, I guess. The career. I mean, it's been very rewarding, and I love doing it. Any great frustrations? Oh, I guess, as in every other career, you know, there's, sure, there are frustrations, but I mean, that's all part of, of, of working, isn't it? Did you ever expect your life to unfold the way it has? No, I never planned any of it. That's interesting. What did you have in mind? Oh, uh, to, uh, you know, to work as little as possible and make as much money as possible and live as nicely as possible. I, you know, I pl obviously planned to be a designer, but I had no idea that I would be a designer in New York and that after opening my first collection, I would be a successful designer and be a name and a known name. And I had no idea about any of that. Is it all still exciting for you? There, yes. I always go to Europe and think, oh, my God. I have to look at another 50 collections of fabric, and after looking at 50 times 200, how could you possibly find anything new? And then you open up the suitcases, and there are those wonderful things that suddenly there's something that looks new to you. Is so, each collection like starting over? Always, yes. And I'm just as nervous about it, uh, you know, until we begin to sell the clothes as I am from, as I was the first time. Even by now, aren't you certain and sure no, of yourself never. and your audience? No, Again, you don't want to make the clothes look strange, but you want to make them look new. So you're working within a framework, you know, that, that, uh, that doesn't allow you that much freedom, and yet you want it to be free and new looking. So you, you scares you to death to the, somebody finally buys that dress, <laughs> you know. Thank you, Arnold. Thank you, Arnold Scazzi, for your special warmth and your special candor. You have been a wonderful guest. Thank you.